Again, please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question in the raise hand feature. And um, the first question um, can go to Abby Nisloda from NBC News in Boston. Hi, Dr. Zhao. Good morning. Thank you so much for doing this. A uh, question for you about equity, especially among people of color. What's one thing you think Massachusetts or perhaps all states could be doing to improve vaccine equity? Yeah. No, this is the huge issue. And there isn't a single state in the country that is vaccinating uh, its people of color at the same rate. Uh, as its population, let alone the fact that, of course, people of color suffered disproportionately from this uh, from this pandemic. So this is really a national problem. Some states are doing it better than others, but nobody's doing it well enough. In my mind, uh, there are three things that sort of need to be happening. Um, one is systematic data collection and reporting. I mean, there's still a dozen states that don't report data at all on, on uh, vaccines by race, ethnicity. I just feel like that, that's sort of un unacceptable. We've got to at least be looking at the data. It also by age, income shouldn't just be, um, just doesn't need to be just by race and ethnicity. Um, second is about a lot about where you put up uh, sites. So one of the things I think we have learned over time, and a lot of very thoughtful people have made this argument, that what we often describe as hesitancy uh, of for getting vaccinated uh, in uh, the Black and Latino communities is actually much more about access and that there isn't access to vaccines. And when there isn't access, uh, that's what's hindering things. And I think that is a real issue. And then third, and last but not least is, I really think we need to be partnering with community-based organizations. That there are, in every community, there are different voices, different people who have resonance, who are trusted. And if Massachusetts or any other state really was committed, uh, and we all need to be much more committed than we have been, then working with people who are trusted in those communities, and, and some of them are healthcare organizations, some of them are uh, religious leaders, some of them are other civil society leaders, that has got to be a much, much more aggressive effort and much more proactive effort than it has been so far. Thank you, Ashish. So next question is from Michelle Smith of the Associated Press. Hi, Dr. Ja, um, thank you for doing this. Um, you were talking about demand issues that are coming up um, in a month or two. What should the state, what should the federal government and states be doing now to get ahead of that and address the coming issues with demand? And what areas are you most concerned about having lower demand than maybe you would like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so first of all, I, I'm sure all of you saw there's an ad out this morning um, with all but one of the former presidents uh, talking about getting vaccinated. I thought it was lovely. It was a, it was a great ad. Um, but I think, so to start there, I mean, I just was, that was the first thing I thought of, but it's actually a, a, a segue into, we really do need a campaign. And it's not just going to, I mean, former presidents are great, uh, but not just, you know, not just uh, former political leaders, but having... Uh, celebrities, having um, other people that people trust. I and mean, I think back a little bit to what happened with the polio vaccine campaign, and it really was Elvis getting vaccinated that made this tremendous difference uh, in, in terms of people feeling uh, more confident about getting vaccinated. So the point is, I think people feel confident when they recognize and relate to and identify with people who are getting vaccinated. Uh, and I think that's really important. So I, I think the, the administration has been talking about a campaign. I think one is starting to roll out. I think you can see a lot of civil society organizations uh, putting together efforts. Uh, so I think that's really great. That's important. Communities that I'm most worried about, you know, people, uh, again, and I brought this up in my last comment, people worry and talk a lot about hesitancy or lack of confidence uh, in, in communities of color. I think it's, that's important. But to me, uh, as I said, I think there the issues are much more about access, much more about trust. Where I'm really worried in, in terms of the data on surveys is among um, conservative whites. Uh, white conservative Republicans are, are among the most uh, hesitant group or, or sort of the least confident group. Uh, and again, I think what we need is we need uh, political, civil society, religious leaders in, in those communities uh, talking about the importance of getting vaccinated, getting vaccinated publicly, uh, but we really need a, a set of targeted campaigns. This is not going to be one national campaign with former presidents. Again, I, 
I love that ad, so nothing against it. But, and that's a great place to start, but, but a lot more micro-targeted efforts to help people feel more comfortable uh, about getting vaccinated because this is gonna be the big issue. And if we, if we get stuck at 60 or 65% uh, vaccinated, uh, we are gonna continue to see significant outbreaks and real challenges in our country. And it's gonna be much, much harder to get back to what we think is normal uh, unless we can get that number higher, at least into the um, 70s, ideally 80s or 90s. Do we have moment, support? yes. <laughs> of course, that was bound to happen. Uh, uh, thank you. So next question uh, is from Heather Berner at Medscape. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, I obviously the um, the focus is on vaccines for very good reasons. I am writing about testing, however, and so I, I wanted to get your sense of what role testing should be playing at this point? Like, are, should we be switching over to those testing sites to vaccination sites? And how do you suggest clinicians kind of balance the capacity needs of both? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. And yeah, I, I, you will not be surprised to hear me say this because I've really been talking about testing for a whole year. And uh, obviously vaccinations are awesome and we need to vaccinate people. Um, we cannot give up on testing. I think testing will remain an important part of our uh, of this pandemic response, of this disease response for years. Uh, and I mean for years, I don't mean just for the next couple of months. So obviously for the next couple of months, lots of infections still happening. Um, I remind people a comment I've made several times, anybody who gets infected today, anybody high risk who gets infected today and dies in three weeks is somebody who would get vaccinated in the next month or so. So we really do need to do everything we can to keep infection levels low. And testing is a really important part of identifying and preventing infection outbreaks. So in the short run, we need to absolutely continue. But there are places where I think testing is really important and we've got to deploy them even as more people get vaccinated. So certainly I think we need to move from a reactive testing approach, which is you wake up, you have symptoms, you need to get tested. That's great. We got to do that. Probably have to keep some version of that, as I said, for a long time. But the proactive testing approach, I've mentioned, mentioned one context, which is schools, where I really think, again, partly because kids are not going to be vaccinated anytime soon. And we can talk about kid vaccinations if, if you want, but um, we're, they're not getting vaccinated anytime soon. And so we should have testing in schools. Uh, I think we're going to ha probably have testing in other types of high risk places, such as I can imagine uh, large indoor gatherings over the summer or into the fall where you're going to have a mix of, of vaccinated and unvaccinated people coming together. We're going to want to have plenty of te testing, a lot of rapid testing uh, available for those contexts, and they have to be relatively cheap and easy to administer. So we need a strategy on testing that shifts us away from this very reactive, uh, we're in the middle of these large outbreaks, towards a model where we're going to have large numbers of people vaccinated, but we're going to want to do quote unquote high risk things, things that uh, in the pandemic, we would have never thought it would be a particularly good idea, but we're going to want to start doing them again. And testing will add a really important level of safety in making those things uh, possible. I'm thinking, again, indoor concerts, plays, uh, other types of gatherings, schools, uh, we, even in colleges and universities, you're going to want to see some level of testing that's going to be ongoing. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, yes, no? Yes, go yes. for it. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so, but for speaking to clinicians, what do you say to them about the capacity issues of scaling up both vaccination and testing at this time? So, I guess a couple of things. I mean, I'm not talking, I don't know, like individual clinicians mostly are not doing a lot of vaccinating. Um, I think where I've seen this trade off, uh, Heather, and maybe you're, you're thinking about it this differently is a lot of states are closing down their testing sites or converting them into vaccination sites. And I worry a lot about that because again, the pandemic is not over and we need to actually expand capacity. And I know it feels hard to say this, we gotta be able to do both. Uh, we have the resources to do both. We certainly have the money to do both. We've gotta be able to run both testing sites and vaccination sites and cannot be trading off one for the other. I think right now in this transition phase of the pandemic, that's really, really important. For individual clinicians, um, you know, you, you need, if you can't provide the testing, you need to have a place you can refer your patients 
uh, because that's going to remain important, at least, as I said, for several more months, uh, while infection numbers remain as high as they do. And they will be continue to come down, assuming B117 doesn't end up being horrible. Uh, but you, we're going to need to continue doing both for some period of time. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, next question is from uh, Susan Kelleher at Forbes. Yes, hi. Thank you, Dr. Jha. Um, I want to circle back to the CDC guidance for vaccinated people, specifically on travel. Um, Bank of America recently uh, released tracking data um, saying that they were tracking their credit card and debit card spend. And they found that there was um, not only a clear bump in people's spending for airfares uh, since the vaccinations have been rolled out, but specifically for the demographic of people 75 and above, which led them to think that these were vaccinated people, you know, thinking, okay, now it, it's okay to fly. Um, so the question I see, I know you, you've said, and everybody has said, and I, have no reason to argue with you that it's not okay to travel now. But at the same time, prices are going up. People are trying to game out when it'll be okay to travel. So the question I'm getting all the time from readers and people that I'm seeing is, is it safe to say book a trip for midsummer or late summer? Um, you know, all of that. So. Yep. Yeah, Suzanne, I, I, I maybe I actually in my opening remarks, and, and clearly I was not clear. Um, I'm not sure that it's not safe to travel if you've been vaccinated. I think the key is you got to keep the public health measures in place. Meaning, you know, like I wouldn't if, if, if I, I have been fully vaccinated, but I think about my parents actually who were now fully vaccinated. And you know, I'm not surprised to see and hear the Bank of America data. I wasn't aware of it, but I'm not surprised to hear about it. Because, you know, my parents want to do is like they sort of barely want to see me. They really want to see my kids, right? Like grandparents really want to see grandkids. And that requires traveling. And the question is, is that unsafe? And I don't believe it's unsafe. So I'm actually saying I think that, that you know, again, would I like get on an airplane as a vaccinated person and travel around the world right now? I probably wouldn't. So I would say people should keep it to a modest level. Again, while more and more people are getting vaccinated. But I think it's reasonable for somebody, as long as you're adhering to public health measures, you're wearing your mask in public, you're doing as much social distancing as is possible on travel. I think it's reasonable for people to start uh, doing that kind of travel. I think um, in terms of more open travel, I, I have to say, I'm just going to give you my personal example. I'm expecting our family always takes a summer vacation somewhere in the country. Uh, we didn't do it last year. We just stayed in Massachusetts. I expect that by the summer we will be able to. Uh, right now my spouse is not vaccinated, but she will be at some point uh, in the spring. And that's my way of saying, I think absolutely people should assume that travel uh, will be relatively comfortable and safe over the summer. Um, I think people can begin doing some, again, modest level of travel now, uh, and people should adhere to public health measures now, but even those will get peeled back over time as more and more people get vaccinated. Great, could I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. Um, I was asked specifically by the owner of a summer resort um, who, and they get a lot of families coming um, and they have a kind of a kids camp uh, and adult camp kind of setup. And um, this owner was asking specifically about rapid testing. So what they would like to do is get some sort of access to rapid testing um, locally, they're, they're based in Vermont, and to be able to offer that as a way of, you know, doing their part, do you think that the, that kind of setup would be possible this summer? I do. I think over the summer, I expect infection numbers to be very, very low. Um, I expect certainly any adult who wants to be vaccinated will have been vaccinated. And the challenge is going to be kids, uh, especially younger kids. I believe older kids, 12 and older, uh, probably will be able to get vaccinated at some point over the summer, but probably maybe even in the later part of summer. Uh, but younger kids, probably not. Uh, and uh, so I think, how do you run summer camp safely? What else can you do? I do think that you can use testing. This is one of the reasons why we came up on testing. And rapid testing with antigen testing should be widely available, and we should be able to use those in ways that keep kids safe in those camps. Uh, I would probably keep some mild mitigation efforts, but very easy in camps in, in Vermont, right? Like keep windows open and, and keep stuff pretty open in terms of 
airflow. But uh, yeah, I do think testing can be an important part of uh, doing those kinds of things. And these tests are relatively cheap and easy to, and should be easy to get. And one last point is that this is an ongoing kind of debate with the FDA is I think we need a lot more of those tests and I think we need more cheap tests. Uh, and the FDA says they're trying and, and, and trying to get more stuff uh, authorized and companies are arguing that the FDA is being too difficult and the FDA is saying the companies are not doing enough and I can't sort it out. But the point is we should have, we have more than enough technology and ability to have widespread antigen testing available to the American people at probably, you know, three, four bucks a pop, like cheap, easy, tens of millions of these things. Um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, but not because of the technology or the science, but because we haven't quite figured out the regulatory issues. Thank you, Ashish. Fantastic. Uh, next question is from Anjali Kemlani from Yahoo Finance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Job. Really great to speak with you again. Um, and uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question is about treatments. I know that uh, during your recent testimony in front of the Senate subcommittee, uh, you discussed that. And I want to know, uh, first of all, your thoughts on the idea that we pursued vaccines first um, and then, you know, treatments kind of have been languishing, but also the idea that of the treatments that are available, none of them are really blockbuster in any way. And so, you know, how should we think about that in terms of variants and the ongoing concern about the continuation of this pandemic? Yeah, no, so right, uh, uh, Anjali, thank you for that question. As, um, as you alluded to, I talked about this at the Senate Health Committee. We need more treatments and we need more oral outpatient therapies and, and let me make the case why. Again, pandemic is gonna enter a different phase. It won't dominate our lives. It'll move from this acute phase much more to we're gonna have to deal with this virus for years. Uh, it'll be endemic, uh, we'll, we'll see little outbreaks and another way to really add a lot more confidence into, and, you know, into people's lives so they can do the things that they want to do is to know that if you are unlucky enough to get infected, if you're one of those people who, again, these vaccines are terrific, they're not 100%. Uh, if you're unlucky enough to get infected and even maybe get sick, which should happen very rarely, but will happen for vaccinated people, or if you haven't gotten vaccinated. Um, we need some set of therapies. And right now we have monoclonal antibodies for the outpatient setting, which require infusion and are hard to, they've been hard to sort of make happen. And then we have, depending on, on how you feel about remdesivir, I would argue three therapies for the inpatient setting. Remdesivir, I think it's got some real benefit, uh, but a lot of people don't. And then we have IL-6 receptor blockers, which just came out out of the uh, UK recovery trial. And then of course, dexamethasone, but these are all for critically ill patients and they do lower mortality, but they're not blockbuster. Dexamethasone is pretty impressive. But the bottom line is, if I were to get infected today, there really aren't very many good options. So we do need to expand that set of uh, capacities. And you know, it's easy enough to look back. I mean, I actually have been arguing for probably since April that we need, again, we need to be able to do both. We need to be able to both do push a lot more on therapeutics and on vaccines. We have more than enough uh, capacity to do it. Uh, I'm thrilled we have the vaccines we have, like thrilled, but we need to do a renewed effort. And I'd like to see a lot more effort around oral treatments. I'd like to see uh, a lot more effort on just running more clinical trials, identifying more therapeutics. Uh, this is not, has not gotten as much attention, energy, and resources that, as it needs, and especially for the long run, this is going to be really, really important. Thank you, Ashish. Next question is from Sarah Schwartz at Education Week. Hi, thanks so much, Dr. Jai. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question about schools. Uh, so over the past month, several state govern governments have uh, required or, or strongly encouraged schools to further open their buildings, um, moving to, to five day a week instruction. And I've heard from some school building leaders and teachers um, that this is making it much more difficult for them to adhere to some of the mitigation strategies that they've had in place on hybrid schedules um, and st strategies that they credit to some of the, the success that they've had with low cases. So things like being able to keep students in cohorts or small groups at lunch or in classrooms and, and to consistently enforce mask wearing. Um, so my, my question is, are, is this you know, um, happening a little bit too soon? Is this something that, that schools should be worried about or, um, or not? 
Yeah, so it's a really good question. And, um, you know, when I started by saying, I think we can safely get kids back to school full time, um, there is the science behind what needs to happen. And then there's the capability of making that happen. Right. And so if getting kids back in school full time means you now can't really enforce the mask mandates uh, in a way that, that keeps most kids and most staff masked up, then obviously it doesn't work. So one of the things that I think we've been thinking a lot about and we've been working with uh, school districts, et cetera, is how do you actually expand and improve their capacity uh, to do things like testing as kids or more kids are coming back so that you know whether you're seeing a bump in infections? How do you improve people's ability to do um, to keep kids in pods and, and cohorts as you bring more children back? I mean, I guess the, the point is that, that that capacity is going to vary from school district to school district. I think at the end of the day, as much as we all want kids back full time in person, um, if you can't pull it off from a kind of health and safety point of view, it doesn't really serve anybody uh, to plow ahead. Uh, the key is to know what are the health and safety measures you need to implement. I think one of the things that slows people down, for instance, and I know I've talked about this, is the three feet versus six feet, which I have felt for quite a long time is is um, is a distraction and, and not really uh, something that we need, I would focus much attention on. Uh, but if we can focus less on those things, focus more on where the science and evidence is about what's necessary, uh, I think we can do this. But yes, it will vary from community to community. And, uh, and what I would generally have been advising governors is instead of kind of yelling at the school districts or the teachers, like, why don't you help them? Why don't you help them figure out how to pull it off? Uh, provide more resources. There's plenty of, of resources now coming from Congress. Uh, expand the school's ability to pull off the safety measures as opposed to wondering, you know, what's the trade-off between safety and, and getting kids back. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ashish. Next question is from Ariel Cohn at GQ Roll Call. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about the variants and on top of that, um, the potential need for these vaccine boosters. I'm wondering when do you think we might need these if they're needed and um, how should prioritization go? Like who should be receiving these boosters first? Obviously, we're kind of in the middle of a big effort right now with the vaccine rollout. So it sort of seems hard to look ahead to the next thing. But um, I'm wondering, like, when you yep. think this will become a big issue and like, how should we prepare for it? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so the short answer is, I think, I don't think any of us really know. And let me lay out the, my thinking on this. And I think, um, so first of all, um, let's talk about B117. I don't think we're going to need a booster for that because our current vaccines uh, appear really quite terrific at, uh, at preventing infections. So, um, so for the short run, give, because that's going to be the variant, the strain that will become, and it'll become the global strain, by the way, like probably in the next month or two, it will be the strain that, that uh, infects uh, most of the people in the world who are getting infected by this. And our vaccines are going to be fine. So then you think about other variants like P1, originally from Brazil, B1351, originally from South Africa, um, the New York one, and start asking questions like, uh, are we gonna need to build boosters against those? And we're gonna, so first thing we need to do is we need to be doing a lot more genomic sequencing. I've, I've been happy to see a ramp up of that. We, I think we need to ramp up even further. We need to see how much those are spreading, but here's a key point. We need to see how much those are spreading in terms of out competing B117, right? So if B117 becomes the baseline, I don't know that we're going to see the South African variant or the Brazil variant really be able to effectively outcompete against the B117. I don't know how much those are those strains are going to end up taking off, which may mean that we may not have to deal with it. May not be a huge problem. It may be really, really um, trivial in terms of how widespread they become. So that's the big unknown, I think, on this right now, is in a vaccinated population, how big a deal would those strains be? If they look like they end up being a big deal, if they end up like they look like they're really starting to infect people and they're starting to see breakthrough infections, I know that both Moderna and Pfizer are already working on, on new versions of the vaccine with, for these boosters. Uh, what I think we should be doing right now is testing them and making sure they're safe. 
And again, I think what we will want to see is if we're caught seeing breakthrough infections in which population are people really getting sick? Is it starting to take off? And then we should be vaccinating and doing booster shots for those populations. And it might be the elderly again, because they're going to be the highest risk of complications. But we might see breakthrough in a different population. We might see it in young people. So there's a lot of unknown right now. What I think we should be doing is building these, testing them, uh, and making sure we have a plan for what we can get going. But I don't know that we'll end up needing them, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but if we do, we should be able to figure out for whom and then, and then use it. Okay, and if I could just ask you one follow-up question. Um, yesterday at the White House press briefing, Jen Psaki said that the extra 100 million doses of the Johnson vaccine that the administration has purchased could potentially be used as a booster if we need it. I did, uh, is that how these vaccines function with the J&J? &J, or was that a, I'm a little confused about that. Yeah, so there is a clinical trial running. As you know, J&J &J one dose. There's a clinical mm -hmm. trial of J&J &J two dose. Uh, and I think, and I've spoken to folks at J&J, &J, no one knows the timeline of when those things are going to become available. I mean, when the clinical data will become available for the two dose. But I think, and a lot of us think that maybe by the end of the summer, we'll have data on whether two doses of J&J &J is better than one dose. And I, it's an honest, I don't know, like whether the second dose will, will provide even better protection than one dose does. And so I assume, and I don't know what Jen Psaki was thinking, but I assume part of what she might have been thinking is if you get data that shows that two doses of J&J &J is better than one dose, then everybody who's gotten a J&J &J vaccine uh, will be offered a second dose. And so having more J&J &J doses uh, is going to be a good thing. I, of course, also think that while we're waiting for that clinical trial, um, we should take a lot of those doses and give them out to the world because we can keep making more. And one dose of J&J &J is really quite terrific. Uh, but that said, I, I assume that's what she meant, that if the clinical data shows that two doses are better than one, then we can do it. And I don't know that the clinical data will show that. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you all. We have 15 minutes left and at least eight more questions. So let's see that we can get through all of them, hopefully. Uh, Doug, uh, Christian from Real Politics has been waiting. Hi, it's good to see you again, Dr. Jha. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, one question I have is, are, are inoculated people vectors for transmission of this disease? And should we be worried until everybody is inoculated? Yeah, so I, I talked about this a, a little bit, Doug, but let me kind of iterate and, and clarify a couple of points. So um, I think we have enough evidence right now to say that these vaccines cut transmission. Uh, that vaccinated people are much less likely to transmit this disease than unvaccinated people. Uh, the things that we don't know as well is how much less. So if, to your question, do they cut transmission to inoculated people? Yes. Uh, how much? We don't know. What's my best guess? 80%. I didn't just make that up. Like if you look across the clinical trials and you look at rates of asymptomatic infection, they seem to go down about that much. Could be 90, could be 70. It's not probably not much less than that. It's definitely not 100%. Um, and so that's the mental model we should use for vaccinated people, that they're going to be much less likely to transmit. And that means that when they get vaccinated, they're not just doing it for themselves, but they're doing it for others. Uh, but they probably can still transmit a little. And there are enough high-risk people in America who have not yet gotten vaccinated that I don't believe we should be relaxing public health measures until high-risk individuals are vaccinated. Um, and we're four to six weeks away from that in terms of all high-risk people being at least having one dose in uh, if they want. And just one other question very quickly, and that is on uh, worst case scenario, if, if states don't abide by CDC regulations and open up way too quickly, what is your worst case scenario for that? Yeah, what I, the worst case scenario is you're gonna see a lot of, uh, you know, and what we've seen in every, Three other instances, it starts with young people. A lot of young people get infected. Uh, one of the things I do want to kind of highlight that we have been learning is that even for young people, like we've been talking about death, the death rates are very low. A lot of people have chronic uh, health problems coming out of this. So even for young people, this is not a benign disease. Uh, but obviously what we tended to see in every other time when we've opened up too quickly is young people get infected, followed by uh, high-risk people, whether they are kind of middle-aged with, with um, chronic diseases or older people. And so that is my big fear, is that with B117 becoming dominant, 
which is a much more contagious version of this virus, uh, open up, you're going to see people unnecessarily getting infected and dying. And again, just weeks and weeks and weeks before they got vaccinated, particularly tragic. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thanks for the short questions. Also, uh, Ryan Quinn from the Charleston Gazette is next. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out whether the um, guidance you put out, it's titled uh, Schools in the Path to Zero Strategies for uh, Pandemic Resilience in the Face of High uh, Community Spread. You put out that guidance um, through the Harvard uh, Brown and some other institutions. I think it was on the Harvard uh, Global Health Institute website. Um, and that was when you moved away from suggesting that school closures or opening status should be based upon a community spread in a county as a whole. But right after you put that out is when, that was I think December 18th is when that revised guidance came out, you started seeing all of these variants um, really starting to spread in other countries. And I think the entry to the US is that guidance still applicable? Should we still stand behind that guidance or, or is, is that something that should be changed now too? Yeah, we're working, I mean, again, uh, this whole pandemic has been about um, learning as we go along and we're working on new guidance on helping um, schools uh, actually um, get better at infection control. But the fundamental question behind your question, Ryan, about how much should community transmission and influence school openings. I think most of us in public health have, have come to conclude probably not that much. Um, it's not irrelevant, obviously, it matters, but the, the, the thinking on this really comes from the fact that we have seen lots of institutions stay open uh, in the face of high community transmission. And the most obvious of which is hospitals. Uh, hospitals have stayed open, uh, obviously, in the face of high community transmission. And, um, and hospitals have remained relatively safe because they've had really strong infection control measures. They've had really good ventilation. They've had uh, universal mask wearing. There's very good evidence that that's what has really cut. And we're talking about infections, obviously, among, uh, among staff and hospitals and also among uh, patients who, who didn't come in with COVID. Uh, we have not seen a lot of nosocomial spread. And so I think that has really, that compared as well as experience of other countries, has, I think, convinced most of us that schools can be open even in the context of higher community transmission. The question of does the do the variants, are they somehow a game changer in all of this? And I think largely no. Um, the variants, you know, there's been, I think, some misunderstanding of data that suggests that these variants are more likely to infect children. They are not. Uh, there are the infections, you know, the, the virus infects kids. Uh, the variants do too. And uh, so I don't think that the variants fundamentally change the approach that we should be taking on schools. Thank you. Next question goes to Cheryl Gay Stolberg from the New York Times. Hi, thank you for take, doing this call. Um, you, you hit at my question a little bit with your remark on Johnson & Johnson, but the Biden administration has said it won't be giving any vaccine away overseas until all Americans are vaccinated. That's their priority. Is that soon enough? I mean, how, you know, when do we have to start giving vaccine away to countries that need it? Yeah, I, look, I'm sympathetic to the Biden administration's sentiment that Americans need to be able to access vaccines. And they, you know, obviously, the federal government's done a lot to uh, both ramp up production and buy uh, and purchase vaccines. I, I think, Cheryl, we have two sets of issues here. Um, one is, I think by May, any American adult, and everything I'm saying about vaccines is for adults, right? Um, I think any American uh, who wants a vaccine uh, should be able to get one by the month of May. And certainly by that time, we'll still be making lots of doses. We'll still be getting lots of Moderna and Pfizer. Obviously, we'll want to have some around because some people may be who may not be confident enough to get vaccinated in April or May may want, may want them in June. So I'm not saying we should have none. But at that point, we will have excess supply. And yes, I think we should start giving uh, vaccines away. Would I, in the ideal world, like to see it sooner? I would, because of two sets of issues. Again, we're seeing in lots of places large outbreaks. We're seeing 
you know, when I think about what's happening across the African continent, there are places where healthcare workers are dying. I really, and, and by the way, the healthcare workers are so far, few and far between in many of these countries that it will take a generation for these countries to build back their healthcare workforce that are getting infected and dying. So before every 18 and 20 year old is, in, is vaccinated in America, would, do I think the world would be better off if we could get healthcare workers in other countries vaccinated? Absolutely. But I'm also realistic that it's gonna be hard uh, while Americans still feel like they want more vaccines than they can get access to. Uh, but I think that time period is about to switch and certainly by May, if not earlier, we're gonna have plenty of vaccines for anybody who wants it. Uh, and at that point, there's no reason we should not be giving away a lot of vaccines to people around the world. Thanks. Next question is for Alison Gorman with ABC News. Alison no longer with us. So let's move to Fran Kritz then. Thank you so much for taking my call. And Dr. Shah, thank you for taking all of our calls over the past year. It's made such a difference in our coverage. Um, I wanted to ask about, you talked about boosters, but I wanted to ask what we know right now about waning immunity and the need for boosters. And if we were to need those boosters, would you have any recommendations to the change in how they were distributed? So I point to the movie Contagion, which shows birthdays. Does this still remain how we did it? Is that the, still the best way if we need to do it again? Yeah, and, and that's a, it's a really good question. And, and the, to the person who asked about boosters earlier, um, I, I didn't, clarify this point. So let me make two points. One is there's boosters for variants because we're worried that somehow our vaccines are not holding up to the variants. And so far, I don't see the need for that. Uh, though there may come a point and we may decide that let's say for instance with the South African variant that boosters will make people a little bit better protected. But there's a second issue which is the need for boosters in the context of waning immunity, which raises the question, how long are these vaccines gonna last? And, and the short answer is we don't know, right? Obviously we don't have long-term efficacy data from these vaccines, uh, but that is not another way of saying we have no idea at all. We do have ideas. I think there's enough reasons to believe uh, that these vaccines um, will provide protection. Uh, and I'm gonna say at least a year, but I think that's actually probably underselling it. It's probably gonna be multiple years, but we don't know. And it's an honest, I, we don't know how long it will last. So I can definitely imagine, and, and the, other thing I will say is it's almost on the other extreme it's certainly not going to be lifelong like the idea that those of us who've gotten a vaccine like now are protected for life that seems extremely unlikely so somewhere between a year and lifelong is the truth and we're going to be sorting all of this out and part of the reason we don't know is because we're still learning what are the correlates of immunity how do you know that someone is protected and we think it's as simple as just drawing some blood and measuring antibodies I think we have pretty good reasons to think that's probably too simplistic of an understanding of who's protected and who's not. So as we as that science gets sorted out, we'll have a better sense of when people need boosters. And my sense is a lot of people got getting vaccinated now probably will need to get boosters next year at some point uh, for waning immunity, but it could be longer than that that we can wait. And I would again sort of begin with high risk people and and uh, and go down from there. And and especially older people may, be, may see their uh, immunity waning a bit faster than younger people. So that also may play into it. And, and so that's kind of how I think about it is again, we should do it by risk and make, and by, by that time we should have plenty of vaccines and the ability to do this quickly. Thank you. So we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Alexandra, Leslie and Laura Puglisi, could you please ask your question one after the other and then Ashish can- I'll ask. just answer them all. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Jha, thank you so much. I'm wondering in light of more Americans traveling um, in the recent, in coming months, what you think about the idea of vaccine passports? Do you think that that is something that is likely to work and how do you foresee that playing out? Okay. And I'll ask mine as well here. Um, thank you for having us. I'm wondering what you think you work obviously here in Rhode Island. What do you think about Rhode Island's vaccine rollout plan? Do you think it's been fast enough, too slow? And then what is Connecticut doing right? Because Connecticut is you know, such high, so highly ranked in their rollout plan. Okay. You really are trying to create local rivalry here. I'm, this is gonna get into trouble, but it's fine. And did we have one more, Stephanie? Uh, let's stop there. Okay, 
Um, so vaccine passports. Um, we're starting to see this in Israel. Um, I think we are going to certainly see it in select contexts. So I've been hearing from um, uh, airlines about long haul flights. So not the I get on a plane and go to Washington DC uh, or Chicago, but the I get on a plane and go to Hong Kong uh, that a lot of airlines are going to start requiring that you show proof of immunization before you do those longer flights. And I, so that to me is a real possibility. Um, and I, I think the, the, this is gonna be a hodgepodge and then we're gonna have to think about like authentication. Uh, I can imagine events that are gonna require people if they're indoors and potentially high risk, they're gonna require that everybody be vaccinated. So, uh, and I certainly can imagine schools, colleges, universities requiring vaccinations. And so what I expect as like most things in America is that we're gonna have a, a mix of different private organizations doing different things, different states being careful about requirements, but doing different things and very little national uniformity. But really this is in my mind gonna be driven by the private sector, uh, not the government uh, in terms of what, what they're gonna need to do to build confidence in people uh, doing this. The reason why the airlines is gonna to wanna to do that is they're gonna to wanna to have people fly to Hong Kong or Australia or, or South Africa. And they're not gonna get people to be able to fly unless everybody feels confident getting on that plane. So that's, I think, the motivation that's going to drive some of these passports. On the issue of Rhode Island, I think the initial strategy in Rhode Island uh, was to focus on some high-risk communities, and uh, and that did slow things down. And, and just like being obviously stating a fact, Rhode Island was, uh, was slow in the initial days. Uh, Rhode Island is now in a very different spot. I think you've seen a real pickup in vaccinations. And uh, it continues to get better. I've been very supportive of, uh, of many of the things that Governor McKee has been talking about uh, in terms of both uh, engaging local leaders and local uh, context, and then also uh, vaccinating teachers and, and staff. And you know, Connecticut just had a very um, kind of aggressive governmental strategy from the early days. Uh, they had someone sitting in the governor's office who really used all the forces of the government, uh, used its uh, relationships with its large delivery systems, used its relationship with provider organizations that had done a really good job on testing to go back to them. So I saw Connecticut as one of the leaders uh, and, and has been because of, of their the approach that they've taken. But I think Rhode Island is catching up. I don't think it's that far behind right now. And, uh, uh, and I think, and I'm pretty, I guess, bullish about the future of vaccinations in Rhode Island. So maybe I stop there. Yes. Any any parting words, Sashish, before we close? Yeah, I know it's, it's after time. Let me just say one very quick thing, which is I think um, we should be really optimistic about where we are as a country. Uh, we have plenty of challenges ahead of us. You know, this is not, we're not, the pandemic isn't over. Uh, but boy, we can mark this horrible year by looking to the, the next one it's gonna be a much, much better year. It's gonna be a much better summer. It's gonna be a much better fall. Um, the virus will come back. It's a seasonal virus. We're gonna deal with it more in the fall and winter, but we'll have much better tools and we can be much smarter about prevent, making sure it doesn't flatten us uh, the way it did this past year. So I just wanna end by saying we should mark this horrible year by looking forward and thinking about all the ways in which it's gonna get better. And we just have to protect people and get through the next couple of months uh, until we're in that much, much better place. And thank you all for joining me today.